We are back with you live once again on another Johnny Torch live broadcast. How'd you like that? The opening theme once again has been added to the broadcast. I was really excited about that when I found out that StreamYard had added the video sharing ability to the streaming service. I was really excited about that because I've long missed the ability to play the intro to the show. Now, that's actually the intro to the Johnny Torch Reviews program that we we used to do in recorded format, which we're going to talk about the direction of the channel. That's that's one of the main reasons I wanted to get on tonight. I feel like I haven't done videos often enough, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But first, I just want to once again give kudos to StreamYard for allowing us that ability to play a clip and I hope it came off well. Of course, I don't have any viewers at this particular moment to tell me if the sound was good or too loud or too soft, perhaps. Um, I didn't get the video up. I just got the music, which was strange. But again, this is a new technology to me, and I will see if I can get the actual video up. But in a way, I don't necessarily want to get the video up because the, the video itself says uh, Johnny Torch Reviews. And this is not a review program today we're just going to be we're going to be john as usual and uh first off i guess let's talk about the uh direction of the channel which is something that's been on my mind for quite some time if you watched my two most recent videos the phil collins solo album ranking and the genesis solo phil collins ranking that we did in honor of phil collins 70th birthday Happy birthday, Phil. Of course, I'm a huge fan. Um, I've got some ideas on what to do with the channel, taking it going forward. Now, for starters, the the channel originally at its at its conception, which is probably about six years ago, it'll be six years in the fall, I believe. Um, it was originally I was going to produce short short-ish 10 to 20 minute clips that would be reviews of upcoming movies I was interested in, of classic movies that I wanted to talk about. And some of them became popular. Some of them became very popular after the fact, which we'll talk about in a little while. I got some, I've got a mailbag segment, which we're going to talk about. And I kind of started getting away from that because Doing comics and doing the videos in the scripted short format was at odds. I couldn't do it. And I had to decide which one I was going to focus my attention on. Now, doing a short scripted video really doesn't take all that long. But between writing and, you know, you also have to... Um, you have to prepare your material, then you have to write it out, and then you have to record it, and the recording sometimes doesn't go too well, and then it's hard to edit with the new software that I have to constantly be upgrading my software because every time I've got a software for editing, it either dies out or something happens to my computer and i got to start from scratch. So it became cumbersome, and of course my first priority is always going to be the comic, Bullets Bourbon Comics. And I had to decide, did I want to be known as a YouTuber? Did I want to be known as a cartoonist, as I affectionately dub myself? Because uh, there's a lot of guys out there that do, you know, live streams and, you know, they, they, they try to, to do both. But really, when you're a, a cartoonist or a comic book creator, you can't really do both. It's either live streams or and, and do your comics or you just dedicate yourself to being a YouTuber and a movie reviewer. And it's difficult to do both. So I kind of put the short form reviews project on the shelf. And there was a lot of projects still I wanted to get to that I never got to that I wanted to do. I'd have to assemble images and so on and so forth. And I concentrated on the Torch News Roundup for the longest time, which was the easiest to do as a live stream, because all I have to do is turn the camera on, look at the the notes, which it takes about, 
I don't know, two hours maybe to assemble notes, pick out some photos, and produce a show just talking about pop culture and some of the interesting things that I'm interested in coming out, like the movies, the TV shows, and so forth. But I, I never really, did, I was never really pleased with doing reviews in that format. I tried doing those reviews live, and it became even more difficult when you have somebody watching the show and wanting to interact to do a review and then try to talk to that person. And if you ignore that person, you're losing a viewer. So you don't want to ignore that person. So you go and try to accommodate your viewer. Uh, and doing a review while you're trying to accommodate viewers is not particularly easy. So I started recording the live streams with, with minimal editing, if any at all. And in that way, I would do my, my movie reviews. Now, come the beer virus, just to be on the safe side, let's just call it the beer virus. There is very little to talk about in way of pop culture. There is not a lot of news coming out. I, I, I debated whether to do a Torch News Roundup tonight because there are a couple of stories we can talk about, and we, we will be talking about them. Um, you know, there has been some set photos of Thor, Love and Thunder. Can I build a 45 minute show around that? Probably not. There isn't really anything else. Anything else I would have to do a review. Um, cause there's a few things going on that we could review, but we'll talk about that later. So basically with nothing really open to me, I've been floundering around for the past, I don't know, six months trying to see what direction this show is going to take and what this show is going to become when I'm not focusing on doing scripted short form reviews. And now I'm no longer focusing on live stream shows about pop culture. There's a temptation to go in many different directions. I could go political. I was considering going into just doing religious topics, which of course is something that's near and dear to me. But I kind of feel that maybe returning to the review format is something that I would like to do at this point. That is why the last, or two weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago, we did the Phil Collins review and ranking. And that was something that was near and dear to me that I was interested in. Because I wanted to do that for a long time, but again, I wanted to do it as a scripted short form project. But dedicating over an hour to it, I was still pleased with it. I still got to talk about the different albums. I, I got to talk about the subject that I wanted to talk about. There was a little editing involved, and but it was minimal and I could take care of it in an afternoon. There wasn't me having to rehearse lines and try to fit images to the, to the um, soundtrack. So I, I think that's the way to go now going forward. I think that's kind of what I want to do. I want to do some more projects that are going to be review oriented. Old projects that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, the next project that I'm going to do that, unfortunately, it probably won't be for several weeks because I'm working on it in my spare time. Of course, this whole this whole idea is going to be at odds with doing the comic. But I really want to make sure that I do both. For those of you who might not have heard before, the ki kind of how I fell into doing reviews and stuff was listening to two guys that I liked at the time, uh, which I still like uh, personally, but uh, I don't really watch their m material that much anymore. But um, watching Captain Logan do the uh, rewinds and watching uh, Oliver Harper do his retrospectives. And they both were pretty impactful on me in, in formulating what I thought I could do on YouTube, which is basically do a little bit more in-depth review of things and not doing just the simple Jeremy Johns. I liked it. I, I hated it. It was okay. I wanted to go a little bit deeper. Um, another guy that I remember coming out a while back was, and he's still around, is a lore runner who does a format, I think, somewhat closer to what I think I'm intending to do now with the channel, which is 
he just turns on the camera for an hour, an hour and a half, and he basically will do a, a deep dive on certain movies, um, the, the Marvel films, uh, Star Wars, and so forth. And I think that's probably the way that I should go at this point. I shouldn't be trying to polish and cut and edit and, and make these reviews the the most polished product possible. If you see Lore Runner, what he does is he just sits there and sometimes with a, an animated background and just talks. And he has a full complement of subscribers as well as views. Now, again, I don't put myself up against anyone else. I just do what I want to do the way I want to do it. But if the format is successful enough for him, and I still want to do these kind of deep dive reviews, there should be no reason why I can't just turn the camera on and do these deep dive reviews off the top of my head. I mean, making some notes, of course. I, I always try to have some notes prepared so I don't forget certain things and just sort of blather on. But um, that's kind of the way I think it's going to go because there are not enough Torch News Roundup topics. And, of course, that show is not going to go away because it's just that we're at a difficult point. Because of the, the, the beer virus, we, we don't have a lot of things in the works. The, basically, Hollywood is sitting on a year's worth of movies that are already done and there's nothing to talk about. And the next crop of movies are so early in their stages of production. It's not really, there's no stories that are newsworthy, really, other than a few set picks of, oh, yeah, take a look at the Suicide Squad. They're standing around in costume. Take a look at Thor, Love, and Thunder. They're standing around in costume. So when there is enough material to make a, a news roundup, they will still continue on but i can't pretend that i can come up with a show every week because i haven't been able to for the past year practically and it's getting difficult and i see thankfully and i want to thank all my viewers i want to thank all my subs because my subs have actually been going up steadily since the new year we're at 169 as of now subs and i thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart, it really means something to me when I see so many subs continually on the uprise. Within the last 28 days, it says I've gained nine subs. And, of course, I want to provide content for people. I haven't done that enough with the YouTube channel because I feel like I don't have enough to talk about. I mean, I've got stuff, uh, sort of a stream of consciousness show with doing the book and the art streams, and coloring the book. But there really isn't enough that I could offer people from that. I, you know, I want there to be something really substantive other than just every week doing two 50-minute stream of consciousness streams, which is what this one is also basically going to become by the time it's finished. So that is the state of affairs. That is the state of the channel. And I just wanted to put people wise. We are going to try to soldier on with some different type of format. I don't know if it's going to appeal to everyone. Because as I said, there's a lot of personal things that I'd like to talk about. Music, for one. As I said, I'm a diehard fan of Phil Collins. And those videos that I did more recently were a long time coming. And I knew that at the occasion of Phil Collins' 70th birth, it was pretty much, it was pretty much then or never, Phil Collins' 70th birthday. The next project I think I'm working on now, I've got some notes that I'm putting together for another video series, um, not about music this time, but I've long wanted to do a deep dive into Star Trek, the classic Star Trek. And so I'm working on that now, and we're going to do a series of videos, probably about an hour long, that are going to take a look at, we're going to start with the, the dark years, the dark ages between the Star Trek original series and the movies, and what was going on at that time. We're going to just briefly go over the failed projects, we're going to go over 
um, the animated series briefly, phase two. I'm putting together some notes for that. I've got some books I've actually sent away for it to kind of acclimate me in the subject. I've, of course, looked online for a lot of um, material. And, of course, we are going to hopefully, after that, conduct a series of reviews of the feature films, the original cast feature films. I, I you know, we'll, we'll go into this more when we actually do the videos. I, I don't really have anything against post original series cast shows or films, but that's not really where my heart is. I'm sort of an old school Trekkie, old school uh, Star Trek fan. And the idea is hopefully getting this series in full swing in honor of William Shatner's 90th birthday coming up next month. So that is the next subject. We're going to try to get out uh, a lot of Star Trek content, and it should be really fun. I think the most fun I'm going to have is with that Dark Ages period in the 70s, from 69 to 79, where there were a lot of projects, a lot of scuttled prospects that they were trying to get on the ground. And just never took place. But we're going to do a show that's going to talk about that. It's going to be a recorded show. And again, hopefully we can get the uh, some reviews of the movies. Where I can just sit and talk for an hour about all the classic Trek films. Uh, the good and the bad, of course. They weren't all <laughs> gems. But we'll talk about them anyway. And uh, that's something I'm hoping to look forward to in the coming weeks. Uh, perhaps starting next month. Like I said, it should be in full swing once I've got my notes prepared by March. So that's the immediate future. And of course, after that, what I've always planned is to try to do uh, reviews of other things that interested me. There are certain things that are difficult to review that are so, that I like so much. There's nothing to talk about other than, oh, it's so great and I love it. And those are the hardest things, which you know, probably during the Star Trek um, series that I'm going to be reviewing, it's going to be difficult too. I'm going to start with the Dark Ages period when there was that big lull, simply because I don't think there's anything I can talk about during the original series. I think that that era has been kind of tapped out. I think everybody knows everything about that period. I don't think there's a lot of videos, at least to my knowledge, that go in detail about what was going on after the original series and before the film series. So that's something to look forward to, hopefully, if you're interested in that kind of retrospectives. And again, that's kind of where my heart was starting the channel, was to go and review classic films that I grew up with, classic TV shows that I grew up with that I loved, and do retros retrospectives of them. Some of my most popular videos are, of course, reviews and retrospectives. I don't have any live streams that go up that high. Unfortunately, the algorithm is not friendly to long-form videos. And that is why my shorter-form ones are a lot more popular. For instance, I did the Karate Kid retrospective. That's up there in my most popular videos. The Wonder Woman... TV show retrospective is my most popular video now. It finally surpassed the 1943 Phantom of the Opera review that I did, which was also quite popular. And it also uh, breezed by what was the longest most popular video of mine, which was uh, Sherlock Holmes meets Tom and Jerry, which of course was a lot of fun. So again, I'm going to try to make a go of this. I'm going to try to continue to do these interesting projects that are interesting to me at least where we get to talk and review these things and hopefully not, not get too long winded because like I said, I think that's what really kills the algorithm. I really wish I could do very highly polished short form reviews the way I used to. But again, it's one or the other. I, I get kind of depressed thinking that I'm not doing the, the long form retrospectives that I want. At the same time, I get depressed if I take too much time away from the books because I really want to turn these books out and keep getting them into people's hands and having at least two issues out a year is important to me. And I can't take too much time away. Now, in the beginning of my YouTube career, that was something I did. I would put the book down for like a week 
or two weeks and try to put, you know, a show together, a series together, a review together. And that just takes away too much time. I don't have that time to waste. And I hate to refer to it as a waste, but, you know, the book has got to take precedence. All right. So speaking of, we'll sort of segue into our, our, let's see. I wish they made this easier because it takes me like three seconds to <laughs> get from one place to another to our mailbag segment. And again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, perhaps someday if I do have the time, the software and the inclination, I will take these long form reviews that I'm hoping to do and maybe shorten them and use them as a lot of smaller individual videos. Like for instance, I could very easily go back and take the Phil Collins ranking video and split it up and just do reviews on the separate albums and just cut out where I rank them and just talk about them as the video, uh, as the uh, review video on the album as a whole. So it's the same thing here. If we're doing these long form reviews, I could at some point in the future, take the reviews and trim them a bit make them a little more palatable for people who just want the bullet points and then maybe direct them to the long form video. Use it as sort of an ad for the long form video so people get both. They, they get a, a fast, jaunty, you know, review that'll just hit the bullet points and then you can seg in, into a long form review. That might be something that'll appeal to, to both people. Who knows? The, the, the short attention spanned among you and the ones who want a nice, long, detailed look at the subject. All right, so I want to talk about here, I got a lot of nice uh, comments on my Wonder Woman, the TV series review slash retrospective. Now, this is the, it comes as no surprise because Wonder Woman 84, of course, spoilers, the cameo of Linda Carter at the end, I think, especially drove a lot of people back to trying to look up Linda Carter's Wonder Woman. And, of course, that's one of my favorite incarnations of superhero television. Of course, the greatest incarnation of Wonder Woman still resides with Linda Carter. But over the past month, we got a lot of comments on that video, and I want to read some of them, as I do all the time. Uh, as I always say, please leave your comments in the description below. I will read them in a mailbag segment of a live broadcast. William Martin left a comment saying, this is an outstanding review of the TV series. Great job. Thank you very much, William Martin. I am very appreciative of everyone that checks out these videos. And uh, I hope you subbed. If you're still uh, listening, thank you for still joining the show. Space Serum, another comment, said, First season was the best, the writing was superior to the subsequent seasons, and Wonder Woman did less talking and more doing. That's a pretty good uh, appraisal of it, I guess. I think, as I said in the video, because actually, I went back and watched it, my, my retrospective on Wonder Woman, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm my own harshest critic, I like to think. So I'm always sitting there watching these things when I do watch them, rarely after the fact. Oh, I could have gone into that a little more. I could have changed this or that. But uh, to be honest, I don't know. I still go by my original view that I held in that retrospective that there was only so much they could do in World War II. I kind of felt that they were sort of shackled by, by having to confront the Nazis all the time. But, you know, again, when they brought her into the future, into then present day, it allowed for the Wonder Woman that most of us growing up with the character in the comics and stuff were familiar with. So I think it was for the best that they brought her to the future, uh, to the present, I guess, I suppose. But to be honest, it, it was, you know, it was just one of those things where they kind of fell back on some of the television tropes of the day and they didn't really probably get as creative as they did when they were having to stick with the World War II theme. 
for instance, like I say in the in the retrospective, they did an awful lot of showing Diana without the glasses and and trying not to make her look very dowdy, which I thought was a mistake. But you know, it, it was kind of like they just had to play ball with what they what they were given, which was to try to make a sort of action series framed around Wonder Woman. All right. Colleen said, I loved Wonder Woman growing up. I remember as a little girl watching it with my mother. She was my idol growing up, and when I was little, I would always pretend to be her. Sorry, Gal Gadot. In my eyes, you will never, ever be Linda Carter. And again, yeah, I mean, that's my that's my feeling on it as well, is that the Linda Carter version is far superior to the Gal Gadot version. Although, I, you know, I don't hold anything against Gal Gadot. I think she does a fine job with the part as given to her, but there's just something about the Linda Carter version where she has an authority in that role that is comparable to Christopher Reeve in Superman. And in even in the worst of the Superman films, he was the embodiment of that character. And I think Linda Carter is the same as Wonder Woman you don't really feel that it's Linda Carter playing a role. I mean, even as a kid, I knew full well that Linda Carter was a different person from Wonder Woman. Christopher Reeve was a different man than Superman. But when you watch them in that character, you can't help but fully buy into it. And that's what I think is a, a, a model of good casting. When you don't even have the slightest doubt that that person is embodying the character. And it's not as easy as, you know, like, for instance, uh, Harrison Ford created the role of Indiana Jones. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, of course, going to seem like he's the perfect Indiana Jones, but we're talking about a character who existed outside of being born on film or television, whatever you want to refer to it as. And to be able to match it so completely... It's, it's once again, it's, it's just that, that graciousness of fate that brought them to the casting of those uh, roles at the time when they did. Shallard One, I think is the screen name of the next individual, says, Casting Linda was genius. And of course, I agree, as I said. You see, Geraldine Mendoza writes, Hello on my Johnny Torch Reviews Wonder Woman 1984. Hello, Geraldine. Let me see. Umblens. I think I'm pronouncing this cr correctly. Umblens. Uh, says, I would rather prefer a 70s Diana. Diana from nowadays comics is more violent and furious. By the way, I really love Gal Gadot's woman, Wonder Woman. I think the love, justice, peace themes are deeper than a hack and slash warrior. Linda Carter's Diana is graceful, charismatic, personable, lovely, and determined, considerate, and an example for everyone. And yeah, that's what I said in both the Wonder Woman 1984 review and the retrospective, the Linda Carter retrospective, is that Wonder Woman is known for being an ambassador of peace. I don't see. I, I, I honestly can't see that version of Wonder Woman that a lot of people have where she carries a sword and a spear and a shield and cutting off people's heads. And that is not the Wonder Woman that reflects what I think of Wonder Woman or the way I ever thought of Wonder Woman as a kid. The lasso of truth was her only offensive weapon. I mean, she had the bracelets for uh, defensive purposes and, the jet and the tiara, I suppose, was an offensive weapon, but she didn't um, have war weapons. She didn't have weapons that were intending to injure and kill people. And I think that's what Wonder Woman should be reflective of, of the ambassador of peace. Now, of course, as a superhero, as a crime fighter, or as an Amazon, whatever way you want to look at it, she is in the position of knowing full well how to deal with villainy, criminality, whatever way you want to look at it. And, of course, violence becomes a part of that. But 
again, it's not uh, something where she's a a killer, which is something that disturbs me somewhat from the more recent incarnations from, I guess, what, the 90s on. All right, and finally, we've got one more from Luis Enrique Perez, who said, I hated Deborah Winger as Wonder Girl. Completely wrong for the character. I'm going to respectfully disagree with that. I thought she was fine. Um, don't know why you're saying that. Um, I bet you're entitled to your opinion, but I don't know. I, I, I thought she played that uh, sort of... I don't know, sort of like a naive teenager, you know, it, it worked for me. I don't know. So anyway, thank you to everyone for your comments. And all right. So moving on now, before we uh, get into the artwork portion here, I'm, I'm doing sort of a, uh, just a free form thing here. I'm not even working on the book yet, but uh, let's take a look at, there was one more thing that I really wanted to um, talk about here, just briefly, was uh, I wanted to mention the passing of Christopher Plummer, and it might have been his passing that really started getting me on the Star Trek kick again, because Star Trek, to be honest with you, it's sort of further down the pipeline of my franchise favorites. I kind of feel bad for that because it was honestly one of the first. I think the first franchise that I ever liked was comics, of course, superheroes. Uh, about the same time, I, I fell in love with Bill Bigsby and Lou Ferrigno's Hulk and Christopher Reeve's Superman. And I think shortly thereafter, probably Adam West's Batman. So I was, I was fully into superheroes and comic books long before anything else. But Star Trek was actually number two because Star Trek came on like gangbusters in the early 80s when we still had, well, now you had cable. You didn't just have the four or whatever it was, five, six channels. Um, I'm old enough to remember the time when you just had the four, five, six channels, but not by much. But um, by the time I was old enough to start watching TV, though, um, you know, everybody started getting cable in in the early 80s, and Star Trek was just like a ubiquitous presence on television. And, of course, I I probably should save this for like a Star Trek retrospective, but as a young child, that was one of my earliest memories of watching television, is probably sitting down in front of the television watching Star Trek every afternoon, or I think it was evening, technically. It was probably around 7 o'clock. They used to show the reruns. And I'd get over there and I'd have my little Star Trek action figures and the little plastic play set from, from um, the motion picture that came out, which was really a chintzy thing. It was, it was molded plastic with some stickers on it. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. But yeah, and that was probably my first exposure to Star Trek being probably five or six in the very early 80s. And uh, I get nostalgic for it now, thinking about how it's been about, I don't know, two or three years since I watched the movies. And I don't really see it on television anymore. It was one of those things where it was always on television, so I never bought the DVDs. And so you would just click on any cable channel, and then you'd happen, to happen across Star Trek, and you got to watch the episode, of course, unless it was a, <laughs> one of the bad ones. But... um so again, this is sort of like, it feels like a part of my childhood coming around again now, seeing another part of it departing from the scene. Of course, in Christopher Plummer, who as many lads of a certain age like myself will probably best remember as General Chang, the Shakespeare... Sh <laughs> I know I was going to get tongue tied with this. The Shakespeare spouting Klingon warmonger of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Uh, Plummer passed on at the age of 91 this past week. And of course he had a, he was a prolific actor. He, he even into his later years did a lot of roles and, and kept it going. And, uh, he, he kind of became sort of a joke 
almost um, not that he became a joke, but there was a running joke, sort of like Betty White, where if someone was taken out of a role, it's, well, let's get Christopher Plummer, you know, and that was like a joke that went on in recent years because I even made a joke about it myself saying that um, he would be cast as Spawn at some point whenever Todd McFarlane got <laughs> the Spawn movie off the ground. But, uh, of course, he was in The Sound of Music, which I think I saw once when I was a kid. I honestly haven't seen that one again in, like, I don't want to say how many years. And, you know, he was the consummate actor. He was a, a great talent. And he brought something to Chang. I don't want to get into it too much because, like I said, I hope to review those films in the coming weeks. But he brought something to Chang that was different from what we'd seen in Klingons up to then, but was necessary. He, he brought a very charismatic portrayal to what, in my opinion, was becoming a caricature. I think the Klingons were becoming caricatures. But, at, you know, we'll talk about that some other time. And uh, But that's what I'm always going to remember about Christopher Plummer. Have we not heard the chimes at midnight, Captain? Rest in peace, Christopher Plummer. All right, so... Once again, let us see. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about here? I think that's about it. So we'll go to we'll go to the book, and I'll do a little work on it before we wrap it up. Because, in all honesty, I have not eaten dinner yet, <laughs> and it wouldn't be the first time. That a show was probably stopped because of the rumblings of my belly. <laughs> but uh, as of now, we're going to try to get a little work done. This, of course, is the most recent image I've released of Bullets Bourbon number eight, Temptation Eyes, where we see Veronica is not against using her feminine wiles to try to get her way as Bullets in Disguise is trying to get an audience with Tom Ado the consigliere of the Vegetable Garden Gang in the pool hall here where he is. He's waiting for a meeting with a very important character, which we'll have to wait and see what that character is when you actually read the book. All right, so let us... I'm going to color the page next to it here while I do a little talking. All right, so I was thinking of the Super Bowl. We could always talk about that. I actually got pretty close in picking the Super Bowl right this year. I got the Bucks right, of course, because we all knew Tom Brady was going to win. Come on. Seven big Super Bowl titles now under his belt. Can you believe it? All the Brady haters out there, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can cry more. Says he did it. I but my score, I got this, I got it close to the score, but I didn't know the Chiefs were gonna fall apart that badly. Honestly, it looks like Mahomes looked like he was just out there defenseless. I don't know. But Mahomes already got a win last year and He's got a lot of time ahead of him to win another one, so I'm pretty happy for Brady right now that he got that big win, number seven. Unfortunately, it wasn't with us, the New England Patriots, but I think most, I think most New England fans are still happy for him. I, I honestly don't know why they couldn't come to an agreement with him. I mean, if he had nothing left. It'd be one thing, but you could tell he's still got the desire to play. He still is the ageless wonder, and quite honestly, I think you let the guy play as long as he wants to play, seeing as how, what he's done for this team, what he's done for New England. The Patriots, now see, I'm again, I'm old enough to remember the Patriots when they were a joke. They were a joke. I was more or less a Miami fan when I was a kid, because... You couldn't root for the Patriots. They wouldn't win. They wouldn't even get close to winning. So I was never a Patriots fan until Bill Parcells got on the team 
as the coach. And then, of course, he brought winning to New England. And that was, of course, in large measure thanks to Kraft, Robert Kraft, uh, who became the owner at that point. So once it was shown that they could actually be competitive, see, I'm not a bandwagon jumper because I knew Parcells was a good coach, but he never won a Super Bowl for them. But I was still a fan at that point. And then, of course, when Belichick came in, that's pretty much where New England was transformed into title town. Of course, it's no small measure because of Tom Brady. It was a big, that was a big, it was fateful, you know, big fateful event that he actually, because he was, of course, a sixth round pick. I kind of have a feeling people that are uh, watching these videos are not that much into sports. And honestly, I'm not either. But uh, I just want to say congratulations to Tom Brady because, again, great quarterback, the greatest of all time. You can't convince me otherwise. And I know there are a lot of great quarterbacks in, you know, recent years as well as in the past, the distant past. But, you know, the, 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 the record speaks for itself. All right, so... I've got some ideas I was saying on Twitter. If anybody has any suggestions, feel free to let me know in the comments. But I've got an idea for a crowdfunding perk. But it needs to have... I need to have a fabric pen. I want a silver fabric pen. But I don't want one that's gooey and, and leaky and impossible to style with. So far, I haven't been able to find anything like that. But if anybody has any ideas for something I could look into, let me know. Because I got a silver Sharpie, just a regular silver Sharpie. And I'm afraid it's going to wear off the fabric. Now, I'm not talking about fabric that you can wash over and over and over again. I'm talking about just a piece of fabric that I have to design on. Unfortunately, I can't quite find something that fits the bill and I might just stick with just a plain regular silver sharpie but again any any hints along the road would be helpful I've got uh, I just got through playing well just got through it was about I don't know three four weeks ago I got through playing the mafia video game I guess this is the original where it takes place like in the 30s it's a pretty good game. It reminded me a little bit of uh, of uh, the Godfather video game. So that was pretty cool. And now I'm going to move on to... Um, uh, I bought the Avengers. The uh, PlayStation 4 Avengers. And I just barely started it. I did like some, some uh, training thing with... Um, Tony Stark. So I haven't really gotten into the game proper yet because I don't have the time, but I'm trying. That's another thing. See, when you're trying to do artistic work like this, and I got to spend a couple hours doing this a day, and then when you have YouTube, you want to keep that going, and then when you have video game, you can't do everything. There's just not enough hours in the day. And then they want to know why. There's just not enough hours in the day. That's why not, not everything gets done. And you have to decide what's most important. And like I said, for me, the book is always going to take precedence. Uh, let's see. I don't know. There's not much else to say about the book because I don't want to get. I don't want to give too much away. But as I said, this has been. Uh, this one's called uh, Temptation Eyes. But the next issue is going to be called The Death of Bullets Bourbon. Whoa! Whoa, did I just say that? Yep. That's what it's going to be called. And again, like I always say, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a terrible thing to sort of play with one's expectations. I mean, kind of when you have an ongoing series like this, you always think to yourself, well, 
you know the the, the protagonist is not going to die, and probably the antagonist is not going to die. And most of the ancillary characters are not going to die. But to me, I think as long as you feel that there's sort of a, a regret. Well, let me let me back that up a little bit. What I'm trying to say is, even if the character's death doesn't take, so to speak, and they don't stay dead, which I'm not saying is or is not the case with Bolt's Bourbon, but it's all in how you do it. It's all in whether you have that emotional attachment to the character. So when it happens to them, when it happens, you feel like you've been through something. And that's why I think, again, I don't want to talk too much about this because that's, we could talk about that very easily in the Star Trek review, but that's kind of like what happened with Wrath of Khan, with Spock. It isn't, it isn't when you look back at it, it isn't any less powerful because Spock came back. It was still what you felt for Spock in that moment, what you felt for Kirk feeling for Spock in that moment. And that's why I think when a lot of people act like, well, the death didn't take and uh, it, it's cheating, you're cheating the audience, this and that. No, I mean, you can say the same thing with, like, for instance, Coulson in the Avengers movie. For all we knew, he was going to stay dead. And the emotion was real. And it affected people a lot. You know, we didn't want to see him die. And then they bring him back. And you'll have people complain, acting like, well, that's cheating. Well, no. I wouldn't say it's cheating. What I'd say is it showed you the depth of your emotion for this character. It showed you, as well as others, I suppose, that you cared for the character when you reacted that way. When you thought he was going to be taken away from you. When he was taken away from you, literally. That is not a cheat. That is not a... Sort of weakening of the story. Or, or, or making the story trite or something. That doesn't... That doesn't register to me. I think, I think the fake death... I just ruined that. I think the fake death is... Or can be very... Let me stop this. Wait a second. There we go. The fake death can be very powerful. And it depends, though, solely on how it's used. Um, it can't be used capriciously. It can't be used just to solve a story problem. It has to be organic to the story, and it has to be like, you know... It has to be believable that that was what that character would have had happen to them in the moment. You know what I mean? That's another reason why I always say like Star Trek uh, Seven uh, Generations didn't work because uh, Kirk's death didn't really work in the moment. It felt more like the story wanted him to die. The storytellers, I suppose, the, the script writers. And you can't have it that way. You can't walk into a story saying, well, this is the one so-and-so dies. You can't do that. You have to go into the story with the mindset that this is just another story. This is the last day for this character, but nobody knows that. Nobody else knows that, but the, the ultimately the viewer. But on, on first glance, they shouldn't even know that. It should just seem like a day like everyone else. Unless, of course... The story calls for that. You know, it depends on what you're writing, I suppose. But you can't, like, just signal to the audience, this is the end for this character, and that's the reason why this story is being told. Now, in the case of the death of Bullets Bourbon, again, we are saying up front that this next story is going to be the culmination of the battle between Carrot Top and Pencil Neck. I mean, Carrot Top, I always do that. Caraton bullets bourbon. So there has to be some kind of reckoning. One is going to win and one is going to lose. And that's one of the situations that you can also do too, is you can have the battle for all the marbles. And I think that's kind of an interesting way to go because when you do that, you're setting 
you're setting the audience up for surprise as well. You don't know exactly which way they're going to go. And, you know, they don't know which way you're going to go, I, should, I guess I should say. All right, we're going to uh, stop this here now because we're coming up on close to an hour. I didn't get too much work done here on camera, but I will continue this on after dinner. If you have happened upon the show, thank you for stopping by. Please leave a like and share if it is so within your will. And uh, come on back next time we do a show. I try to do a show on Sunday, uh, Saturdays, uh, sometimes Wednesdays. If uh, I don't do one Saturday, it's usually on a Wednesday. And again, as I said, we are going to be doing some different things. We're going to be reviewing some different things. I want to get a video out there pretty soon. Um, that's going to be a review. I'm not going to say what in case I change my mind, uh, which is always my prerogative. But, uh, of course, I want you to check out the Adventures of Bullets Bourbon Private Eye, which you can find the link in the description below to my website, where you will find Bullets Bourbon Comics. You can find the first three remastered editions of the Bullets Bourbon Chronicles. You can find Bullets Bourbon, the Family Jewels, which is issue seven, the first part of the next three issue story arc. And of course, we're working on Temptation Eyes now and the next issue, which will be after that, The Death of Bolts Bourbon. So thank you for joining us. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next we meet, this is Johnny Torch reminding you once again, keep the flame burning brightly, and I'll be with you again real soon. Mm -hmm.